Good afternoon, Your Honor. Alan Jackson from Worksman Jackson and Quinn, along with Elizabeth Little from Worksman Jackson and Quinn, on behalf of Karen Reed. Good afternoon, Mr. Jackson. Good afternoon, Ms. Little. Here for the Rule 17 motions, who's going to argue those? So, Your Honor, there are two motions before the court that we'd like uh, to be heard on. One is the motion to uh, renew our motions to compel, which we'd like to be heard on first, if the court pleases. Okay. And, this, and I would be arguing that motion. With regard to the Rule 17 motion for the animal control records, my colleague, Mr. Jackson, would be arguing that uh, second, if the court pleases. Okay. All right, I'll hear you. <clears throat> Thank you, Your Honor. May it please the court. We are seeking immediate access to John O'Keefe's clothing, to all evidence seized from my client's vehicle, to tissue and other samples from John O'Keefe's autopsy, and to the original Canton Library video, which we still do not have. We are asking this court specifically to set a hard deadline for access to this mandatory discovery and evidence. Um, <clears throat> Your Honor, at the outset, it is important for me to emphasize why a deadline needs to be set. Uh, it's important to emphasize why time is of the essence for our access to this evidence. It's been 15 months since my client was arrested and falsely charged with killing John O'Keefe. Prior to 15 months ago, my client was employed in two prestigious positions. Prior to 15 months ago, she had a robust health insurance plan that covered her numerous serious medical conditions. But 15 months ago, she lost everything. 15 months ago, these false allegations began to destroy her life. And for the last 15 months, she has been fighting for her life. 15 months after her arrest, she has no income. She does not come from a wealthy family. Her father was a, a respected and now retired educator. Her family is very squarely middle class. But given that Karen Reed is now fighting for her life, whatever money that they've saved is all going to her defense in this case. She's hired private counsel from two coasts. She's hired multiple experts at considerable costs. And when I say considerable, I mean tens and tens of thousands of dollars. Um, and the meter is running with each passing court date. She can't afford to scrimp on her defense because her life is at stake. In the 11 months that this case has been pending in this court, we have continually asked for access to the same basic mandatory discovery evidence. We've been prohibited from inspecting that evidence. In February of 2022, the police seized John O'Keefe's clothing. It's now May of 2023. We haven't seen it. We haven't inspected it. We haven't been able to test it. In February of 22. They, uh, the police sees pieces of taillight from my client's vehicle, pieces that they claim to have found at the residence where John O'Keefe died, despite the fact that multiple searches initially turned up nothing. Pieces of the taillight were only found after Trooper Michael Proctor, conflicted Michael Proctor, had seized my client's vehicle and had it in his possession for well over an hour. That evidence needs to be put to the test, and it needs to be put to the test now. We have been prohibited from testing it, from inspecting it, from even seeing it. There were tissues and other samples from the autopsy of John O'Keefe to which we've been denied access. We believe that when those samples are, testing, are tested, the results will be exculpatory, likely case ending. But 15 months after she was arrested and 11 months after she was arraigned in this court, that evidence remains hidden from the defense. The police have maintained exclusive control over the event data recorder and the Lexus infotainment system from my client's vehicle. We have seen neither, and this is simply unacceptable. Prohibiting the defense from inspecting this evidence is infringing on my client's constitutional right to a speedy trial, and it's infringing on her right to due process. It's almost three months ago that we last appeared before you, Your Honor. We requested access to these items uh, and yet again, have, uh, the response from the Commonwealth was that they would be tested soon. Uh, the prosecutor had represented within 30 to 60 days. That's on record. It's now close to 90 days. We've made zero progress. This court did order that the Commonwealth request expedited testing, but that order has yielded nothing. I asked the court to set deadlines then, which the court was not inclined to do. 
Three months later, it is crystal clear that deadlines need to be set. Without a deadline, we have no assurances that this case will not drag on who knows how long into the future. With each passing day, my client, who not only is presumed to be innocent, but is factually innocent, remains jobless, with inadequate health insurance, and with each passing day, her savings and her family's savings continue to be depleted. There is no time to wait. There is no time to waste. It is time for excuses to end. As we noted in our motion, the prosecution and the crime lab move very quickly when they want to. In other cases pending before this very court, the very same investigators secured DNA testing within two weeks of opening their investigation before anybody was charged. Contrast that with our case, where we, here we are 15 months later, no such testing has even started. Regarding the Canton Library video, this court should know we still do not have relevant time periods. From the Commonwealth's evidence, we know that my client drove by the Canton Library at 12.16 a.m. on January 29th because that was recorded. There is video of her driving by at that time, heading to 34 Fairview, which is where John O'Keefe died, uh, with her taillight intact. We know that my client arrived back at John O'Keefe's residence at One Meadows Ave in Canton at 12.41 a.m. because the Commonwealth produced a voicemail that she left for John where you can hear the garage door closing, the car door closing, the house door closing while she walked in her high heels on the garage floor. One Meadows is about a mile from the Canton Library. We know the video equipment was working because they have that footage from 12, 16 a.m. But in the video that the prosecution turned over to us, there is a gap in that video from 12.37 a.m. to 12.39 a.m., which would have been the precise time my client would have been driving back past the library. We know that that footage would show that my client's taillight was still intact at that point because she never struck John O'Keefe with her vehicle. Yet the prosecution has produced a video from the library with that crucial time period missing. This evidence is strictly in their possession. We've been told that the Canton Police provided the evidence to them via a share file, I'm sorry, the Canton Library <coughs> provided this evidence to them via a share file link with a guest I uh, ID and a guest password. We need that link, that user ID, and that password. We cannot rely on Trooper Michael Proctor, conflicted Michael Proctor, to sanitize exculpatory evidence before sending it to us. We need the original footage. If the Commonwealth answers that that original footage no longer exists, then we'll need an evidentiary hearing to put the relevant parties under oath to find out what happened to it. The bottom line here, Your Honor, is that we've spent 15 months trying to uncover the truth. We are not afraid of whatever evidence is un unearthed from whatever source, because for 15 months, every stitch of evidence has been consistent with my client's innocence. However long this case lasts, and I sure hope the prosecution comes to their senses and realizes they have no case because they've charged the wrong person, but however long this case lasts, the remaining evidence will drive a stake through the heart of this prosecution. In the meantime, my client suffers. In the meantime, her life is on hold. While she spends every waking moment defending herself, emotionally, intellectually, and financially, we cannot abide by excuses any longer. We need this court's help. We need you, Your Honor, respectfully, to hold the prosecution's feet to the fire. We need this court to order the Commonwealth to stop trampling on my client's rights to a speedy trial and her right to due process. We need this court to set deadlines for the production of this evidence. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Mr. Lally? Yes, Your Honor. Uh, so, in response to counsel's motion, uh, just in response to the statement that uh, every piece of evidence that's been provided thus far is inconsistent with the defendant's guilt and consistent with her innocence, uh, I would have a large issue with that. Uh, but as it pertains to these particular pieces of evidence, uh, counsel's right in that motion was filed. Counsel's right in that uh, motions were allowed uh, when, uh, as related to uh, inspection of said materials, and the Commonwealth has no issue with inspection of materials once they're back from the lab. Now, the last time we were before this court, back in February, uh, the court had asked uh, 
myself to uh, reach out to the lab and see if there was anything that could be done to expedite the analysis. I did that, um, spoke uh, with and filed the, uh, the necessary paperwork with the lab to uh, expedite as much of the analysis that could be done at that particular time. Um, so at that time, uh, what I was uh, provided with was a deadline of uh, no later than May 5th. Uh, those items, at least as far as the trace analysis and the criminalistics was concerned, would be completed and I should expect something uh, close to that date. Um, I confirmed with the lab uh, as of yesterday that that timeline is still uh, a viable one. Uh, the case is currently in technical review. Uh, so once that's completed, then we should have reports uh, that I'm able to provide to, uh, to counsel. As it pertains to the inspection and, and the return of the items from the lab to uh, the Commonwealth's, uh, well, at least the district attorney's office or the state police's custody, one of the issues uh, that we've uh, had with that is that uh, in order to facilitate some of the necessary DNA testing, some of that testing would be exhaustive. And in particular, there is a hair sample that uh, was recovered from the rear right quarter panel of the defendant's vehicle. Um, it was taken to the lab, and I was informed by the lab that any testing of that for DNA, uh, and for comparative purposes to Mr. O'Keefe, uh, would be exhaustive. Uh, so on March 10th, I sent counsel a uh, exhaustive testing form uh, that needed to be filled out whether or not they want an expert present for that testing or don't want an expert for present, uh, present for testing. is really immaterial, but I need some sort of authorization from counsel before the, uh, the sample is subsumed during the course of testing with, uh, with the lab. I haven't heard anything back from counsel. I spoke to counsel numerous times. I sent emails. I heard no response as, as far as that. So as far as the DNA testing is concerned, the delay on that is because I, I don't have anything back from counsel as far as whether or not they want an expert present, who that expert is, how to contact them, and how to facilitate uh, the beginning uh, steps of, of, of that particular testing. Uh, so that is why, the, in, at least in no small part, why some of the items are still uh, contained at the lab is because the testing is still yet to be completed. But I do hope to have the trace and the criminalistics, and I expect that uh, by next week at the latest. Uh, and again, you know, whatever deadlines uh, that the court sees fit to uh, or deems fit to put on certain things, uh, as far as that's concerned, uh, is certainly within the court's prerogative. I don't think that we need deadlines. I don't think that we need an evidentiary hearing as it relates to it. But that's where it stands. Um, as far as the video is concerned, the video was uh, provided by the IT director for the town of Canton. Uh, there was a uh, share file that was shared with the troopers. Uh, the troopers, upon uh, receiving that, it was uh, Trooper Dunn uh, who received that video, not Trooper Proctor. If I could just speak briefly as, as it pertains to Trooper Proctor, there is no conflict. Trooper Proctor is not conflicted in this case. I, I indicated that uh, specifically in, in some of the oppositions that were filed to the Rule 17. So there's been some photograph uh, taken from a social media site which is purported to be Trooper Proctor with one of the McCabe's children who were a witness in the case. The, children that, the child that's depicted in that particular photograph is not one of the McCabe's children. The McCabe's have four daughters. That's not one of them. It's a relative of Trooper Proctor. It has nothing to do with the McCabe's and nothing to do with this case. Whatever conflict counsel believes uh, Trooper Proctor has just doesn't exist. Now, as far as the video was provided to Trooper Matthew Dunn uh, of the CPAC unit with the district attorney's office, that was then shared with Ms. Crawford. Uh, it was a, a person in our office who uh, uh, specifically uh, who deals with uh, forensic and uh, surveillance video and type uh, evidence. It was then archived on our system. Uh, recently, uh, we reached out and spoke to the IT director with the town of Canton again. That share link I tried uh, to send uh, to council. Uh, email essentially wouldn't go through. We tried to open it. Uh, essentially, it won't open. Uh, so the link expired within 30 days, of, uh, within 60 days, if not 30 days, of it uh, being shared with our office. But the exact information that was provided by the town of Cannon was archived uh, by Ms. Crawford, was then provided to council uh, at her arraignment in Superior Court, uh, as well as I uh, was able to download it onto a Citrix file, which I then shared with counsel uh, earlier this week. Uh, so what we have as a video, what exists as a video, what we were given as a video for those relevant time frames was placed onto the, onto the uh, archive within our system, was then placed onto a disk, and what's on the disk, what's been provided to counsel, is what we received. Okay. All right, your next motion. That would be Mr. Jackson. Okay. okay.
Good afternoon, Your Honor. Uh, may it please the court. Uh, we are, as indicated in our papers, we are seeking summonses, and this is dealing with the animal control issue, that, that Rule 17 motion. We're seeking summonses directed at two entities, the Canton Animal Control and the Canton Town Clerk, both. They, we believe they both have records. We know they both have records. These are records that we need, the defense needs, to shine a light on Karen Reed's innocence. These are records that are central to our theory of the case. And these are records that we have no other option to get but through a summons they've indicated to us. They have the records, but they need a court order. They need some sort of a summons. Your Honor, in furtherance of this motion, I want to talk for a quick second about a couple of undisputed facts. Undisputed fact number one, uh, on January 29th, 2022, Officer John O'Keefe was found dead in the yard of Brian Albert at his house at 34 Fairview in Canton. That is undisputed fact, where he was found dead and what the circumstances were surrounding that death are why we're here now. Second undisputed fact, when John O'Keefe was found, he had this set of wounds on his right arm. The medical examiner indicated that these wounds were concomitant with his death in terms of the, the temporal, uh, the time that he died. Uh, these were wounds that he suffered at or near the time that he died. And the Commonwealth looks at these wounds and says, eh, there's nothing to see here. Why are we looking at this? This is, uh, you know, you're, you're, you're following a red herring, basically. This is just a road rash. Uh, this means nothing. It, it, it has no impact on our case one way or the other. This is, according to the Commonwealth, simply a, a set of injuries that John O'Keefe suffered at the hands of being struck by a moving vehicle. Well, first, I would ask the common sense question, does this look like a road rash? I mean, the court's got years, decades of experience, life experience and legal experience. Of course this doesn't look like a road rash. It's not a road rash that any of us have ever seen. Or does it look more like claw marks and bite marks from an animal, which is exactly what they are. Second, if it was a road rash, where's the rest of the road rash? John O'Keefe had one set of injuries like this. Deep scratches, deep puncture wounds on his arm, on his right arm only, from mid biceps to mid forearm and no other place. For instance, mid biceps and mid forearm that you might put in front of your face or your body if a large animal was attacking you, resulting in these wounds. Why is, are the wounds confined just to his right arm? What about all the other pointy bits of a human body if someone is rolled under a car or rolled because in gravel because of the car? What about the shoulders? What about the knees? What about the ankles? What about the elbows? None of that exists. These are the only wounds that are confined to his right arm and they're deep scratch wounds, puncture wounds that are indicative of claw marks and bite marks from a large animal. And third, what about the Commonwealth's own expert? She has to have opined about this, correct? She has to have said during the grand jury, I mean, this was a full-throated investigation surrounding the potential murder of a police officer. What does the, the Commonwealth's own expert say? First of all, she was never asked by the Commonwealth during the course of the grand jury about the injuries. It took a grand juror actually asking the question of the witness, and she said, no, I cannot say that as a road rash. There's certainly not enough evidence to suggest that these wounds are consistent with a road rash. Well, she had to have at least talked about the fact that it was an animal, right? She had to. The Commonwealth had to have asked that question. She actually said nothing about whether or not that's consistent with an animal, because the Commonwealth very particularly did not ever pose that question. But we did. We hired one of the preeminent medical examiners in the country, a, a doctor by the name of Sheridan, Frank Sheridan, and he wasn't some deputy medical examiner. Dr. Frank Sheridan was the medical examiner for San Bernardino County in California with more than 12,000 autopsies under his belt, the supervising medical examiner for one of the largest counties in California, and he concluded to a scientific certainty that these wounds are from an animal attack. Period. Full stop. So, what do we know about animals and the albums? Which is exactly where 
Officer John O'Keefe was found dead. In February of 2017, we know that the Alberts had a dog. There's a photograph of Brian Albert with a dog, Chloe, in the foreground. By 2019, the Albert family had registered ownership of that German Shepherd. Moving on to 2022, in January of 2022, specifically January 29th, John O'Keefe suffers these animal puncture wounds, these animal scratches, the animal, these animal bite marks that are heretofore and up to this date, today, completely unexplained by the Commonwealth. By May of 2022, Karen Reed's defense team starts asking questions about this animal, about these injuries, about the dog about what dog existed uh, at, the Bryan's, at the Albert's house, uh, where is the dog. We started inquiring pretty significantly. That same month, amazingly, the Alberts informed the Canton Animal Control that the dog was remarkably and mysteriously rehomed. The dog was gotten rid of. And to date, the Commonwealth has yet, as my colleague just mentioned, has yet to re release the tissue samples to us for DNA testing to determine if there's evidence in these wounds of a canine attack, which we believe there will be. During that grand jury testimony, Brian Albert admitted to three things. Number one, he admitted that he owned a large German Shepherd. His words, not mine. A large German Shepherd. Number two, he admitted that the dog was at his home on the night John O'Keefe, early morning hours, John O'Keefe was killed on January 29th, 2022. And the dog, according to his own testimony, was inside the house and never in the front yard, which is where John O'Keefe's body was ultimately found. And the third thing that he admitted was that the dog was, quote, not great with strangers, end quote. That's a dog owner's euphemism for the dog bites, the dog attacks, the dog is mean or can't be mean. So why wouldn't the Commonwealth ask about these injuries? Why wouldn't the Commonwealth inquire, as we have been inquiring, about the nature of these injuries and their significance in terms of John O'Keefe's death? It's because they know that the answer completely obliterates their case. Their theory of homicide would fold if they got the true answers to these questions. The answer exculpates Karen Reed, and the answer inculpates Brian Albert. That's because if that dog was inside the house that night, not on the front lawn, not in the front yard, but inside the house, and these injuries were suffered or sustained at the time John O'Keefe was killed, then that means John O'Keefe was inside the house when he was killed. And it also means that his body was moved. That's consistent with the facts that we also know to be true, which is not one person, not one person that was in that house and ultimately exited that house from that party that night, not one saw John O'Keefe's body laying in the cold in the front yard. And that's because he wasn't there yet. Multiple people walked out of the house, multiple people who would have no other reason, who would, would have no reason to lie about that. A 200 pound man, six foot two, lying in the front yard on a light dusting of snow in dark clothing. Not one person saw him. But if John O'Keefe was beaten unconscious in, for instance, the basement of that house and later moved to the front yard after the guests had left, there's your answer as to why no one saw him. And it also answers two other questions which are looming in this case. Why would Brian Albert rip out the floor of his basement months after John O'Keefe was killed? The second question, why would he sell his house? So in the months following John O'Keefe's death, the dog has been gotten rid of, got rid of the evidence in the basement, got rid of the house, the crime scene, 
itself. Your Honor, I would submit to the court that evidence is literally being destroyed right under our nose. It's been reported that the federal authorities have now gotten involved in the circumstances surrounding this case and are, have impaneled a grand jury, a federal grand jury, to investigate some of these circumstances. But Karen Reed should not have to wait for the feds to figure out which heads should roll. I would implore the court, now is the time for the court to take some action and give us the tools, the defense, the tools that we need to fully investigate this case. We need these records to track down this German Shepherd, if it's still alive, which clearly is an open question. Our understanding is, at least up to this point, is that the dog was not only rehomed, but rehomed out of state, out of the jurisdiction of this court and out of the reach of the defense, or at least that was the attempt. We need those records to find where that dog is. If the dog still exists, we need a saliva sample, we need a hair sample, we need something. And then we need the Commonwealth to give us the tissue samples that were taken at the time so that they can be compared. This is vital to the defense. We ask that this, the summonses at issue uh, for the two entities that we've described, uh, that those summonses issue, our the request clearly meets the Lampron standards. Number one, it's relevant evidence. Number two, we definitely need a subpoena or a summons. Uh, they will not provide the information without a court order. Number three, this information is necessary for our defense. And number four, contrary to what the Commonwealth constantly says, oh, well, this is just fishing. I think we've established this is not just fishing. We got a fish on the hook. We just need the, the, the court to help us reel it in. I will submit on further oral argument regarding the uh, the issues uh, or the uh, the summonses surrounding the animal control and camp town clerk. If the court has any further questions about those, I'm happy to, to answer them. If not, uh, I can certainly give the court a preview of the second 17 uh, in Rule 17 motion, which deals with the phone records and the actual phone of Brian Albert. But but I believe. The court has indicated and we've suggested that an evidentiary hearing is in order. As I understand it, the parties have agreed for an evidentiary hearing and we rearranged our schedule a bit so that we could accommodate you. That's perfect. Okay. The only thing I would say in furtherance of that, uh, very briefly, is the Commonwealth has suggested that, that that Rule 17 is just sort of a regurgitation of something that we filed back in, I think it was September, that could not be further from the truth. There is new information, there's dozens of pieces of new information that we have. What I'm, I'm going to do because of that, let's let Mr. Lally respond to your remarks on the of course. question first. Thank you, Your Honor, first I would state it's, it's an inter interesting sort of uh, straw man argument uh, as far as it being road rash or that the Commonwealth has always maintained that it's road rash on his arm. No one has ever said that but counsel for the defendant. Uh, as far as the injuries uh, are concerned to uh, Mr. O'Keefe's uh, right arm and right forearm, uh, they've always and consistently been described as, as abrasions uh, caused by blunt force trauma. Uh, not road rash. I'm not really sure where the road rash uh, comes from. What I would submit in conjunction with that is, uh, again, divorcing whatever evidence uh, the defendant claims from the context of the rest of the evidence and the rest of the case. Um, it's a little peculiar and conspicuously uh, clear from, from the defendant's fact section uh, that the damages to the right rear corner uh, panel of the defendant's vehicle embedded within the bumper to that vehicle is pieces of a cocktail glass. The victim, Mr. O'Keefe, is last observed on surveillance video, external surveillance video from the waterfall establishment that he left just prior to going to 34 Fairview, Fairview excuse me, with a cocktail glass in his right hand. The same arm that's injured, the same type of glass that is then recovered from the bumper of the defendant's car. As the court is well aware, and I just uh, stated for the record, uh, under Rule 17, uh, the defendant has the burden, uh, or the moving party has the burden, to establish that the documents are evidentiary and relevant. Secondly, that they are not otherwise procurable reasonably in advance of trial. 
Uh, thirdly, that the party cannot properly prepare for trial without uh, such production and inspection. And fourthly, that the application is made in good faith and is not intended as a general fishing expedition. Uh, the issue uh, the Commonwealth takes uh, with the defendant's request as it applies to uh, these particular records is with number one and number four. Uh, the Commonwealth would submit that uh, the showing uh, from the defendant is simply insufficient uh, to establish any relevancy or evidentiary value uh, to these records. And then secondly, uh, that this is uh, the very epitome of a fishing expedition. The <clears throat> indication, uh, even from the, the verbiage uh, that's used by counsel in the motion, uh, uh, sort of uh, sheds light as far as uh, the, as I just stated, uh, the sort of epitome of a fishing expedition. It's language such as it could shed light or if true this fact would undermine the prosecution's entire theory of the case. Uh, there have been a couple of theories that are stated within uh, the context of counsel's motion. I can state for the record those are not the Commonwealth theories. No one ever said uh, that the vehicle struck Mr. O'Keefe in the head and that's what caused the injuries. That's actually not at all what uh, the grand jury testimony or the evidence uh, has shown uh, throughout the course of this investigation and throughout the course of this case. But those could and if true, those uh, very words by definition uh, evince uh, the, uh, the very nature of, of this particular request. Uh, the first issue uh, would be with the time frame, as it's stated within the motion, it's from 2015 to present. Uh, I'm not sure uh, why so expansive a time frame is, is needed or necessary or relevant to anything uh, that is a subject matter before the court. Uh, as counsel uh, suggests, uh, that uh, photographs of Mr. O'Keefe's injuries suggest that he was severely beaten and left for dead, uh, having sustained blunt force injuries to both sides of his face as well as to the back of his head, uh, that there's evidence of defensive wounds, there's a cluster of deep scratches and puncture wounds to his upper arm and forearm, uh, and then the defendant essentially asked the court to take the then inferential leap that these injuries, which are wholly inconsistent uh, with the injuries noted by both the emergency medical personnel at Good Samaritan, when Mr. O'Keefe was taken immediately from the scene where he was, uh, his body was discovered, and from the medical examiner's finding and sworn testimony, uh, so wholly inconsistent with those, that these are then take the inferential leap that these are consistent with uh, bite marks or scratch marks from an animal, uh, specifically a dog. In support of these assertions, as counsel stated, there's an affidavit from Dr. Frank Sheridan that the injuries are consistent with animal claw or scratch marks. Well, we've had an interrupt in the feed there from the courthouse at uh, the Dedham Court, but we've been listening to attorneys talk about their motions in the case of Karen Reed. Let's go back. As far as uh, how the medical professionals detail what those injuries are. In those medical records, uh, what the personnel at Good Samaritan, the doctors, the nurses uh, who examined Mr. O'Keefe when he came into their facility, they describe his injuries as a right superior orbital ridge region, approximately seven millimeter laceration. Uh, positive for surrounding soft tissue, swelling and uh, positive breath sounds bilaterally, pulseless, uh, positive superficial abrasions to the right forearm. Uh, Dr. Scorty Bello, the medical examiner in this uh, case who testified at length before the grand jury, uh, described Mr. O'Keefe's right arm injuries uh, as scratches caused by a blunt object. Uh, she described or noted that they appeared to be in a linear pattern. Uh, she detailed uh, that she observed no signs of an altercation or fight uh, from her thorough internal and external examination of Mr. O'Keefe. And lastly, she testified in great detail as to the swelling of his eyes being related to the fractures in his skull and how those manifested into the observable swelling and discoloration of his face. And essentially what she testified to was that there was a laceration on the right back of Mr. O'Keefe's head, that there was a skull fracture in that immediate area, the right parietal area of uh, the victim's skull that that then caused a swelling on the brain, which she observed, as well as Dr. Stonebridge observed during her neuropathology uh, examination of Mr. O'Keefe's brain post-mortem. That then caused the swelling uh, underneath of the skull, caused the radiating skull fractures uh, that she observed in Mr. O'Keefe's skull throughout, and that the uh, essentially nowhere else for the blood uh, to go in the looseness of the vascular issue, uh, tissue behind the eye then causes both of the eyes to swell. There was no evidence uh, that Mr. O'Keefe was beaten and left for dead. There was no evidence of any defensive wounds. Uh, she was specifically asked uh, those questions and testified to that uh, before the grand jury as to uh, those injuries and, and how they uh, sustained. 
There's absolutely no evidence that Mr. O'Keefe ever entered uh, the residence at Fairview uh, on that particular evening. Uh, counsel mischaracterizes uh, some other statements made by a witness, Mr. Brian Nagel, who had uh, come to pick up his uh, sister at the residence. Uh, she came out, he observed that vehicle, he observes that vehicle from the entirety of the time that he's there. So he's pulling on to Fairview, Ms. Reed is coming on to Fairview in the opposite direction, the right blinker on and a left blinker on. The operator of the vehicle that Mr. Nagel is in then uh, essentially flashes its lights and allows Ms. Reed to pull in first. So Mr. Nagel is there the entire time uh, that Ms. Reed pulls onto the street when she pulls up. Indicates that she initially pulls over to the right hand side of the curb, then pulls the vehicle forward a little bit further. That's corroborated in testimony from a number of different people who were inside the house, as well as Mr. Nagel's sister, uh, who then uh, came out of the house and talked to her brother uh, at the door of the truck that he was uh, riding. Mr. Nagel further indicated that at no point did the brake lights come off, including the center top light of the SUV that he observed in front of the house. Uh, there were no footprints outside of the vehicle. He never saw anyone exit the vehicle. No one in the house uh, reported ever having uh, anyone come inside the house or seeing anyone exit the vehicle. And I'm a little confused uh, just as far as uh, counsel's uh, statements, as far as the uh, multiple people saw uh, Mr. O'Keefe uh, or never saw Mr. O'Keefe uh, come into the house. Or if he comes into the house and he's attacked by the dog, I, I'm just a little confused as far as is, is there, are they in the conspiracy or are these people sort of let out of the conspiracy because they say something that, that doesn't further that conspiracy? If they're all in the house and Mr. O'Keefe comes in the house and gets attacked by a dog and then gets dragged out to the bottom of the lawn and left there for dead, then why do they all testify that no one came into the house? Uh, it's, it's consistent throughout uh, the entirety of all the witnesses. It's consistent with Mr. Nagel as well. It's consistent with the forensic evidence. It's consistent uh, with every piece of evidence uh, that has uh, come to light at this point. Um, and there's further statements in regard to the dog. Uh, some reported uh, incidents several months after the death of Mr. O'Keefe. Uh, the council suggests ineluctably that the, the animal was violent and prone to violence from one incident that postdates uh, this particular uh, time frame of uh, Mr. O'Keefe's death and seems to, to, to punctuate that uh, this circumspection uh, on and on about how violent the dog is from an incident that he has no information about, whether or not it involved another animal, whether or not it involved another human, whether or not it involved what exactly the incident occurred. This is simply not what Rule 17 is to be used for. That's what the case law uh, has uh, consistently held, is that it is not a discovery tool. It is based on information, relevant evidentiary support, which is completely and utterly lacking in this particular motion, in this particular submission. Uh, so for those reasons, the Commonwealth will request that the motion be denied. Okay. So the, the second Rule 17 motion, are we going forward on that and then having the hearing regarding the um, timing of the video? How are we going forward with this before I hear from you on the substance, Mr. Jackson? What is the next date for? May 25th. Right. Uh, What's it for? The evidentiary the hearing? Yes. All right. So do you plan on arguing your Rule 17 motion today or that day? Not both. That day. Okay. I'd rather reserve and, and, and that makes sense to that day. That makes sense to me as well. So we're finished for today, unless there was any follow-up to Mr. Lally. There, I'm there not is. going to hear a preview on the motion that we're going to hear on that day. That's fine. I do have some points to okay, make. Okay, I'll hear, I'll hear you on that. Thank you. With regard to the dog, um, First of all, I, I, I think the Commonwealth misses the point. If there was a fight inside the house with the dog's owner, the dog would likely attack. That's the, that is the, the idea that is borne out by the evidence that we have. We know that he was beaten. We've got evidence that John O'Keefe was beaten, that he lay there unconscious. And we also have evidence that at the time he was beaten, facially, and, and blunt force was used against the back of his head, he was also attacked by an animal. Well, Brian Albert, who's a known fighter, owns a 90-pound German Shepherd that has since been gotten rid of. 
and had a skin piercing incident as the excuse for having gotten rid of him. So we know that the dog attacks according to, to sort of uncontroverted evidence. We weren't saying, we don't suggest that the dog killed John O'Keefe. We're suggesting that the dog was there when John O'Keefe died and also attacked John O'Keefe. That's the point. Um, this is the first I've heard of the Commonwealth's new position after, what, 15, 16 months that somehow John O'Keefe was stabbed or cut up with a broken cocktail glass, which would produce these injuries? That makes absolutely no sense. It just doesn't pass the sniff test. These are not from a cocktail glass. Who did that to him? Is there, is there a new theory that Karen Reed got out of the car, broke a cocktail glass, then wielded an edge of that cocktail glass and cut up John's arm? Then John stood there while she jumps in the car, slams it in reverse, then hits him with the car, with her tail like in the back of the head. It, 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 it makes absolutely no sense. That is the Commonwealth grasping at straws. If it walks like a duck and talks like a duck, it's a duck. This looks like an animal attack because it is an animal attack. And it's at the same time, temporarily at the same time, that he was otherwise beaten and then ultimately left for dead. Interestingly, that it, it's interesting that the Commonwealth doesn't mention the basement in their arguments. I mentioned the basement because that's very likely exactly where John O'Keefe went once he walked into the house. There's no evidence that John O'Keefe walked into the house. The Commonwealth has evidence that John O'Keefe went into the house. They have it. They just sat on it for several years, or for several months, over a year. That Apple, the, the Apple Health data from John O'Keefe's own phone establishes that once he was at the location at 34 Fairview, he climbed three sets of stairs. The Albert House happens to be three floors, a basement, a middle floor, and an upstairs. His Apple Health data also shows that he took multiple steps after he left the car, after he left uh, Karen Reed's vehicle. Those, the, the multiple steps indicate that he was in the house. If, in fact, the Commonwealth were correct, and he stepped out of the car, was hit by the car, and fell down and died, if that's what their theories, theory is, he would have no Apple Health data suggesting that he was climbing stairs and, and walking about as if he were inside the house and was ushered down to the basement, at which point there was a fight, he was beaten to unconsciousness, and then everybody in the house leaves not having to go down to the basement. There's a door that services that basement that's closed. So there's no reason for people who are upstairs, either upstairs or on the main floor of the house, to even know that there had been a fight downstairs or that John O'Keefe never made it out of the house alive or conscious. With regard to Ryan Nagel, uh, the Commonwealth leaves out probably the most important part of his testimony. Ryan Nagel's testimony is that he arrived just after Karen Reed arrived. They arrived uh, not at the exact same time. She turned down the road. Then he turned down the road. As he approached the road, he then, I'm sorry, as he approached the house, he then pulls to a stop. He had her car in his sights the entire time, just after she had already uh, arrived. Certainly time enough for John to get out of the, the, the car and walk toward the front door. He said that he observed that there was no taillight damage whatsoever. He later observed inside, either through a dome light or through other ambient light, that he could see inside the passenger, passenger compartment of her car and that she sat there alone. And most important, he didn't see her hit anybody with, his, with her SUV. That's the most important part of Ryan Nagel's testimony. He didn't see her hit him, hit John with the car, which he would have had to have seen if he was situated right behind her. And the Commonwealth has repeated what they've oft repeated several times, which is there was no sign at all of any kind of an altercation or fight. Well, if there's no sign of an altercation or fight, how can he turn around and say that a cocktail glass did this? I mean, they can't talk out, out of both sides of their mouth. 
how could they reasonably ignore two black eyes, a laceration over his right eye, a laceration at his nose. Uh, he looked like he had gone 10 rounds with Mike Tyson, as my colleague had, had, has once analogized. Of course there's evidence that he was in a fight. The back of his hands, deeply bruised. Those are called defensive wounds. I don't care what their medical examiner called it. Uh, anybody who's seen any sort of a fight, a street fight, knows that the back of the hands, the back of the arms, get the brunt of the punches as you cover your face. Of course there were signs of a fight. Not just a fight, a brutal fight. And what does a dog do when its owner is in a fight? What does a German shepherd do when its owner is in a fight? Reaches out and attacks and supports his owner. And what does a person do when a dog attacks? Usually puts his arm up, his dominant arm up, to protect himself. And that's where the lacerations, the bite marks, the claw marks appear on John O'Keefe's arm. This is not a fishing expedition. The Commonwealth has an unreasonable expectation. They use, they cite to words that we use what the evidence might show, what it could show, what it potentially will show as a weapon to say, well, see, they don't know what the records are going to show. Well, if I knew what the records are going to show, I already have the records. I wouldn't need the court to ask for them. Of course, I don't know everything that's in the records. And the reason that we asked, Your Honor, for 2015 is because we have evidence that in 2017, the dog looked full grown. So we wanted to go back and bracket the proper amount of time. If the, say the dog was a couple of years old at the time that photograph was taken in 2017, we want all the records associated with that dog, uh, which means we bracketed our request. It's not overly burdensome. It's certainly not burdensome to the, to the Canton Animal Control, and it's not burdensome to the Canton Town Clerk. And if the records don't exist, because they just don't, they're too old, then no harm, no foul. But that's why we bracketed uh, our request to go back from 2017, uh, sorry, 2015 to present. And with that, Your Honor, I believe that we have made uh, a good faith showing. We have met the standards of Lampron, all four standards of Lampron, and the summons it should issue. And also, all right. Anything else, Mr. Lally? Just briefly, Your Honor, as it pertains to. Uh, Commonwealth would agree that uh, attributing the cuts on Mr. Uh, O'Keefe's arm in their entirety to cocktail blast would be somewhat ridiculous. That's not what I said, um, and that's not what I was attributing them to. And I, I think the court understood that, but just so counsel understands that as well. As it pertains to uh, Mr. Nagel, uh, what is in his testimony is that he had the vehicle. They arrived at the residence in tandem. The vehicle was there when Mr. Nagel left. So while he sees no one exit the vehicle, no one enter the house, and no one else sees uh, anyone exit the vehicle or enter the house during that specific time frame, the defendant, and presumably Mr. O'Keefe, are still there and still in the vehicle at the time Mr. Nagel leaves the house. That was the point uh, that I was making with that. As it pertains to the Apple Health data, and, and obviously we'll get into this a little bit more when it comes to that uh, subsequent Rule 17 motion, the Apple Health data is the same Apple Health data uh, that's being relied upon for the supposition that Mr. O'Keefe went inside the house. That same Apple Health data has, among other things, Mr. O'Keefe taking 46 steps and traveling a certain bit of distance around 11.56 a.m. on January 29th. The problem with that is that he was uh, pronounced deceased at the Good Samaritan Medical Center at 7.50 a.m., some four hours prior to that. In addition to that, uh, from the information as far as uh, when that uh, sending or descending of stairs occurred between, I believe it's 1221 and 1224 a.m., uh, there's a Waze search and uh, location data from Mr. O'Keefe's phone. The Waze search is conducted, and the GPS location information from Mr. O'Keefe's phone shows him en route to the house and not arriving at the house until 1224 a.m. So the information the council is relying on has him going up and down three flights of stairs before he's even at the house. Uh, so for those reasons, again, uh, the Commonwealth would uh, submit that the defendant has not met its burden and ask that the uh, motion be denied. Uh, before we do conclude, I just did want to uh, remind the court there are a couple of the other issues that I need to uh, address with the court, specifically okay. uh, the Commonwealth's motions to impound and the Commonwealth's uh, motion for uh, access to the defendant's phone. <laughs> I'll hear you. 
So there were two motions uh, to impound that the Commonwealth had filed. One pertains to the uh, grand jury transcripts and exhibits uh, that I had uh, attached as attachments or exhibits uh, to the opposition to uh, this specific motion and really uh, to, to okay, both and motions. And those are impounded by statute. Right. Okay. It, it, the other motion to impound that I had filed pertains to the attachments to uh, the defendant's uh, Rule 17 motion pertaining to Mr. Albert's cell phone uh, and the call detail records of Ms. McCabe and Mr. Albert. Um, now, certainly, the Commonwealth is not saying in any way, shape, or form that those items shouldn't be submitted. The defendant can submit whatever whatever she wants, whatever counsel wants in support of that request for the court to review. But the manner in which uh, the information is released, and specifically what I take issue with, uh, and I'd be remiss if I didn't say this uh, on behalf of the O'Keefe family. I'm not sure they. I don't. I'm not sure they hear you. Okay. In reference to the motion to impound the attachments to the defendant's Rule 17 motion for Mr. Albert's phone and the call detail records of Mr. Albert and Ms. McKay, um, I'd be remiss if I didn't, uh, on behalf of the O'Keefe family, as well as just what the statutory rules are, and specifically I'm talking about the Supreme Judicial Court, Rule 124, pertaining to protection of personal identifying information and publicly accessible court documents, uh, which I would imagine that at least Mr. Nettie, uh, even if Mr. Jackson and Ms. Little aren't uh, familiar with, uh, does uh, provide rules as to how things are filed. Uh, that are of uh, that kind of uh, sensitive nature and that kind of biographical information. Um, and they're routinely filed with the court with a motion to impound or a motion to seal and not filed directly with the media. The issue being uh, that there are photographs uh, depicting Mr. O'Keefe post-mortem uh, at the Good Samaritan Medical Center as well as uh, possibly some autopsy photos uh, that should have been impounded. There are unredacted uh, Canton Police Department reports, multiple uh, copies, uh, again, not anything that uh, Commonwealth takes any issue with the court reviewing, but as far as them being made public with those witnesses, names, dates of birth, social security information, addresses, phone numbers, uh, things of the like that should be impounded pursuant to the statute as well. And in particular, uh, I do take issue uh, with uh, particular that motion, specifically on page 11, there is a specific reference made to the name of uh, the decedent's niece. Uh, which is uh, strictly uh, prohibited as far as being uh, provided in a public uh, document. So for those reasons, I would ask that the attachments uh, to that motion, uh, to whatever extent it can be at this point, given the, the public release of them, uh, be impounded. Mr. Yanetti. Your Honor, I believe that some of that information may be in the public domain already, so it may be that the cat is out of the bag with regard to some of it. Um, we're at it is now, uh, right? It, I'm sorry? It, it is, uh, the cat's out of the bag now. Right, right, right. yes. So, I mean, we're, we're, we're agnostic on this motion to impound. Um, you know, we have access to it, the Commonwealth has access to it, and most importantly, the court has access to it. All right, so by statute, everything that um, was raised by the Commonwealth was supposed to have been requested to be impounded at the time it was filed. So that was not done. Um, are you talking about the motion that we filed with regard to the uh, Albert phone motion? Yes, the attachments. Mr. Lally just outlined it. I don't think that there were any grand jury minutes attached to that motion. No, that was a separate motion that Mr. Lally just right. filed on behalf of his motion. Right, and we don't have When he was taking issue with the, with the defendant who filed. Right. Okay. Uh, yeah, again, we don't have an objection at this point. All right, Mr. Clerk, those are both allowed. All right, is the hearing over? Those are both allowed by statute. So is this hearing over? Your Honor, if I could just address, uh, the Commonwealth had filed some time ago a uh, proposed procedure regarding communications stored in the defendant's iPhone. So we had addressed this uh, briefly, I think, on the, on the last court hearing date in February in relation to uh, the defendant's phone. So the defendant's uh, phone was uh, seized lawfully from her pursuant to a search warrant. A, the information uh, contained uh, therein was then downloaded. Uh, upon a cursory review of that information, there was uh, an indication that there was some communication between Ms. Reed and Mr. Yannetti uh, contained within uh, the information within that phone. Uh, so obviously all uh, examination of uh, Ms. Reed's phone from the Commonwealth's perspective ceased uh, at that time. Um, and we had begun exploring and uh, filing this motion. I had it in hand to file with the court on the last date. Uh, however, after uh, several discussions with Mr. Yannetti and counsel for the defendant, I was uh, then informed in court on the last date that the, uh, the AFE or the um, 
the independent sort of forensic examiner that would look at that phone was uh, believed to have some sort of conflict. It was, was not acceptable to Mr. Yannetti. So there was a separate person who uh, essentially runs the lab at the Attorney General's office, who I spoke to Mr. Yannetti about uh, whether or not that person would be acceptable. Uh, he does have a conflict, just so the court is aware, as far as uh, grew up in the same town as uh, the victim and his siblings. Uh, but Mr. Yannetti indicated that he, uh, at least verbally to me on that date, that he didn't see any issue uh, with that conflict, as the, the person would just be assigning it to uh, a couple different forensic examiners within his office. Um, I then modified the motion to incorporate that uh, subsequent AFE, sent a copy of the motion to counsel uh, six weeks ago or so, uh, and still received no response. Uh, so what I'm looking for today is, is action on that. The other thing that I would note for the court is that counsel had asked for a uh, raw uh, extraction a copy of the material from the defendant's phone, which was then provided uh, to counsel on March 22nd. So for over a month, uh, the defendant has had access to the defendant's phone and the Commonwealth has not. Uh, because counsel has uh, failed to uh, respond to whether or not the AFE was uh, reliable or not. And, and what I was referencing on the last court date is uh, the court had indicated that if we were to come to some sort of agreement, the court could act on the papers and obviate the need to, uh, to address it on this date. It hasn't happened. Uh, I would submit that the proposed protocol was more than reasonable, and I would ask that it be allowed by the court. So, Mr. Unetti? Yes. Uh, I was the one to suggest that it be analyzed by the Attorney General's Office uh, Cyber Crimes Division. Um, I thought that that was clearly, we have no objection to that, but I'll announce it in open court. We have no objection to that. The, the motion for the uh, protocol uh, you know, uh, procedure is, is agreed to. And you're okay with the individual that was cited in it? Y yes, the individual who was cited in it is the head of that unit. Um, I, I know who he is, um, I respect him. He revealed to me uh, at the start that he has a personal conflict. I have no issue with him assigning it to somebody in his office. Okay. So the motion's allowed by agreement? That's fine. Okay. Thank you. Yes, motion's allowed by agreement. Uh, just one other thing. Uh, Mr. Lally had mentioned to me, and I don't know if he still intends to be heard on this, but there was uh, an issue of exhaustive uh, testing that I thought... He argued that a while ago. Okay. And was that acted upon by the court? He said he was waiting to hear back from you where we stood on that. Right. So with, with regard to that, Judge, um, we're, we're all for exhaustive testing as long as we can have our expert present at the time. So, so. Mr. Lally, would you explain to it? Would you say again what you explained to me? Certainly, Your Honor. So there's a form uh, that's provided by the lab that I then provide to counsel. In this case, in any case, that uh, where exhaustive testing is, is necessary and the sample will be subsumed uh, within the analysis. So I provided that to counsel. I just simply need counsel to execute that form, indicate whether or not they want someone present and who that person is, what their contact information is, and then I provide it to the lab. The lab will then contact their expert and schedule a time for the testing to be done. Okay. We're happy to do that, but my understanding from Mr. Lally's earlier argument is that only applies to the hair that was found on the car that was not part of any motion that we had today in terms of a motion to compel. What about the other evidence um, with regard to the tissue samples and everything else that we actually asked for in our motions today? Is there, there exhaustive, exhaustive testing on any of those items, Mr. Not Lally? that I'm aware of. Okay, fine. Yeah, so we'll sign, we'll sign uh, regarding the hair. We don't, we're not concerned about the hair. Okay, is that everything? From the Commonwealth, yes. I believe so, Judge. Thank All you. All right, thank you. We'll see you on the 25th.